In your Bible, 1 Kings, we will be in chapter 3 tonight. And we saw, how I'm sorry, yeah, chapter 3. We saw, uh, last time we, we went to Chronicles and, and saw how all of the plans for the temple were given to David by God by revelation. And Kings doesn't make that as clear. Chronicles goes into much more detail on that. And so I thought it, it was important to look at that. And so David is gone now. And it says in verse 1 of chapter 3 of Kings, 1 Kings, And Solomon made affinity with Pharaoh king of Egypt. And so, so he's, he's making a partnership. They're buddies uh, with Pharaoh. And he took Pharaoh's daughter and brought her into the city of David until he had made an end of building his own house and the house of the Lord and the wall of Jerusalem round about. And so uh, this, is, this is Solomon's wife. He, he's going to marry Pharaoh. Most likely this is a, um, a marriage of um, uh, covenant or agreement or, you know, he's, he's, um, he's, he's friends with Pharaoh and so they don't want to have any wars with each other. And so Solomon marries his daughter. But here's the question. When we read the Song of Solomon, uh, it talks about the Shulamite. And it talks about the love that Solomon has for the Shulamite. And what is a Shulamite? And nobody really knows. And so here's the big question. Is this Solomon's first wife? And is this okay? And is she the Shulamite? And I don't know, and I think so, and I don't know. Because... The Old Testament told the people of Israel not to intermarry with the Canaanite tribes. Okay, uh, But if the daughter of Pharaoh were to attach herself to the people of Israel in the way, let's say, that Ruth did, who was a Moabite, uh, then there might be nothing wrong with this marriage. Okay, And it's really interesting because... Nobody can answer that question. And it's really fun because lots of guys just start hammering Solomon right here. Ah, he married this foreign woman and she's going to lead his heart astray. Actually, the Bible doesn't say that she led his heart astray. He's going to take more wives. And they are going to lead his heart astray. I, 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 I got to be honest. I've thought, I've prayed, I've looked, I've studied, and I just don't know. I just don't know where this gal stands, and I don't know if she's the Shulamite or not. There is a group of people who think that Solomon, that she's actually not Solomon's first wife. There are some people who think that, that the Shulamite is Solomon's first wife, that she's the wife that he married while he was young, while David was still around. And some people even think that the Shulamite and the Shunamite are the same thing, and therefore that Solomon married Abishag. And... Bible doesn't say. So I'm not going to go with that. I'm going to go with, as far as I know, this is his first wife, and she's the daughter of Pharaoh. So it says, only the people... Um, uh, let's read verse 1 again. Solomon made affinity with Pharaoh, king of Egypt, took Pharaoh's daughter, and brought her into the city of David, until he had made an end of building his own house, and the house of the Lord, and the wall of Jerusalem round about. So, Solomon's going to enter into this massive building project. It's going to take years. Only the people sacrificed in high places because there was no house built unto the name of the Lord God until those days. Now, that's, that, is, that is true. There is no house built. But the tabernacle is still pitched. Only it's, it's busted up. So you've still got the tabernacle at Gibeon. But you don't have the ark at Gibeon because David has brought the ark out Uzzah has died. It's gone into the house of Obed-Edom, and then it's come. Actually, it got stolen. Uh, went into kirjath Jerim. Then David brings it from there to the house of Obed-Edom. Then from the house of Obed-Edom, he finally brings it to Jerusalem, and he pitches a tent for it in Jerusalem. So the ark is in Jerusalem, but the tabernacle is still at Gibeon. All right. So it says the people sacrificed in high places. And what we are to take from this, I think, is that the people are sacrificing to God, but they are doing it in high places. Now, this whole idea of high places is a very pagan concept. Um, you know, up on the hill, you're, you're closer to God. And so they are doing this. Now, prior to the building of the tabernacle, 
we see the patriarchs offer sacrifices to God in certain places like Bethel and, and other places where they would construct an altar and offer a sacrifice. Uh, so so the, the people have got this, they've, they've actually begun to go away from the worship of God in a way because they're not offering their sacrifices at the place that God has chosen. And he doesn't tell us here that this is good or bad. He just kind of tells us this is what's happening. And so the people are kind of scattered in their worship. They're definitely not focused. They're definitely not zeroed in. And this is the beginnings of paganism because that's what the pagans are going to do. Okay, And it says in verse 3, And Solomon loved the Lord, walking in the statutes of David his father, only he sacrificed and burnt incense in high places. And you, you see the way that that's phrased. Only. He loved the Lord and he walked in the steps of David his father, except. Now, don't let that be said of you. Well, I'm a Christian, but I cuss a little. You seen those t-shirts? I'm a Christian, but I drink a little. I'm a Christian, but I, you know, listen, I know that we all sin. But don't ever get comfy with it. And don't ever, don't ever let that be said of you. He did everything we're supposed to except this, and it's just going to start from this to something else to something else to something else to something else. Okay. But please notice there in verse three it says Solomon loved the Lord. That's a good thing. Not only did Solomon love the Lord, but the Lord loved Solomon. Turn back, if you will, to Second Samuel chapter twelve. <clears throat> after David and Bathsheba's child died, the Bible says in verse 24, 2 Samuel 12, And David comforted Bathsheba his wife, and went in unto her, and lay with her, and she bare a son. And he called his name Solomon, and the Lord loved him. And he sent by the hand of Nathan the prophet, and he called his name Jedidiah because of the Lord. So, so, Solomon loves the Lord. The Lord loves Solomon. Josie asked me a great question today. She's like, Dad, how come does David start out being a good boy and then wind up being a bad boy? It's a great question. It happens an awful lot. It's very unfortunate. But we're going to see the same thing with Solomon. How come does some people start out being a good boy and wind up being a bad boy? Well, answer to the question, number one is, is because... Their heart got moved away from God. They began to follow after the lusts of their heart. Answer number two, there are no good boys. She, she, she's a, um, she doesn't like my answer to that. And I say that tongue-in-cheek, and yet at the same time I don't, because we use that term, don't we? I always say that to our kids. You're a good, you're a good boy. You're a good girl. There's nothing wrong with that. But ultimately... To be inherently good, you are not. There's only one who's good, and that's God. Romans 3.10 specifically says, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. And so, on our own, <clears throat> we are not righteous. And, and the only way that we are righteous is to be seen in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And so, here's a guy who loves the Lord. Here's a guy the Lord loves. And here's a guy who's going to be blessed. He's going to have his socks blessed off. And yet, he's still going to fade in the finish. Right? That doesn't mean that's okay. That doesn't mean that that's a good excuse. It's just God being very, very honest with us in His Word about these people and about what happened. And whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning. Part of the reason that we study and learn these things, and this is why Kings, as we go through that list right over there in the Kings and Chronicles, this is why this is so important because we're going to see guys who follow the Lord and the blessings that come and we're going to see guys who go away from the Lord and the consequences that they face because of that. And, and it's the same for us today. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever you and I sow, that's what we're going to reap. If we sow to the flesh, we're going to reap corruption. If we sow to the Spirit, we're going to reap everlasting life. Okay? And so Solomon loves the Lord. He's walking in the statutes. Only he sacrificed burn off burn incense in the high places. And so so this is this is the the the, the modus operandi of the day. The people are sacrificing 
all over the place. Okay, Something that God told them not to do, He said, you offer the sacrifices in the place where I choose for My name. Only, I think their excuse is because the ark is not with the tabernacle. But I don't know for sure. And the king went to Gibeon to sacrifice there, for that was the great high place. A thousand burnt offerings did Solomon offer upon the altar. Turn real quick, if you will, to <clears throat> Second Chronicles chapter 1, the parallel passage to what we're reading. And you'll see there in verse 3 it says, Second Chronicles 1.3, So Solomon and all the congregation with him went to the high place that was at Gibeon, for there was the tabernacle of the congregation of God, which Moses the servant of the Lord had made in the wilderness. So the reason that Gibeon is considered the great high place is because the tabernacle is there. It's been there for some time, so that's why they're going to go. So here's, here's the final move of the tabernacle. It's going to go from Gibeon to Jerusalem. That's the last time it's going to move. The thing was built uh, after uh, one year after the Israelites went through the Red Sea. It moved over 40 times while they were in the wilderness. Once they came into the promised land, it was at Shiloh, it was at, at Gibeon, and I think someplace else, I'm, I can't remember. Uh, anyway, uh, well, they had to set it up right outside of Jericho somewhere because they uh, carried out the Passover and circumcised all the men before they went to war. So it's, it's pitched in multiple places, but this is it. This is the last move of the tabernacle because they're going to tear it down, they're going to take it to Jerusalem, and that's it, okay? So that's why they're at Gibeon. And he offers a thousand burnt offerings. A friend of mine was talking to a butcher in Lubbock that does their kill for them. And they were butchering hogs. And he asked him, he said, how many can you do in one day? He said, one time we did 30. 30 hogs in one day. They butchered a thousand beeves that day. They burned up a thousand beeves that day. They bled a thousand beeves that day. I mean, you're talking about... I don't know, five, six, seven hundred, eight hundred, nine hundred thousand pound calf that they're that they're uh, offering at this, and uh, talk about a this was a big deal, right? So in Gibeon, verse five, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night, and God said, "Ask what I shall give thee." Wouldn't that be great? Wouldn't that be something? You know, you just come, God comes to you, and He says, "Just ask whatever you want," and Solomon said. Thou hast showed unto thy servant David, my father, great mercy, according as he hath walked before thee in truth and in righteousness and in uprightness of heart with thee, and thou hast kept for him this great kindness that thou hast given him a son to sit on his throne as it is this day. And now, O Lord my God, isn't it amazing? Solomon, his, he understands that him being king is tied to his father, is tied to the covenant that God has made. God chose his father. God made a covenant. That's why Solomon's king. There is no entitlement here. There is no, hey, look at me, look how great I am. There's none of that. And so he says, And now, O Lord my God, thou hast made thy servant king instead of David my father, and I am but a little child. I know not how to go out or come in. What a, a humble thing for someone who's about to be king to say. And so he's saying, I need your help. I am immature. I don't know how to do what you're fixing to hand to me. And thy servant is in the midst of thy people, which thou hast chosen, a great people that cannot be numbered nor counted for multitude. So here it is. This is his, his request. Give therefore thy servant an understanding heart to judge thy people, that I may be discern between good and bad, for who is able to judge this thy so great of people. One of the things that's been unbelievably disappointing over the last few years is to watch the corruption of judges in this nation. To sit back and to watch and to see some of the just blatant, obvious, unbelievably political motivated uh, uh, judgments that have come down. And, and you know, I, I, I cringe. I cringe to think of these people having to stand before God and answer for what they've done in these things, you know? Lies told and just turn a blind eye to, to something and send innocent people to prison and let guilty, obviously guilty people go free. 
And God will not let that go. All throughout his word, he has told us, if you are in a position of judgment, you must judge with righteous judgment. And this is Solomon's, this is his request. I'm just a child. I've got to judge this people. I've got to be their king. I need your help. I need an understanding heart. Turn with me, if you will, to 2 Chronicles chapter 1 once again. And let's see how Chronicles tells us this same story. And he lets us in. He phrases it a little bit differently. And when we lay these together, it's, it's really good. 2 Chronicles chapter 1 and verse 10. He says there, give me now wisdom and knowledge. So in Kings, it says, give me an understanding heart. In Chronicles, it says, give me now wisdom and knowledge that I may go out and come in before this people for who can judge this thy people that is so great. So, so this understanding heart is a heart that understands wisdom, that understands knowledge. This is what Solomon prays for. And so uh, he, he says in verse 10, and the speech pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked this thing. This is all taking place in a dream. And God said unto him, because thou hast asked this thing, and hast not asked for thyself long life, that would be a, a, you know, probably pretty high on the list of things if God were to come to you and say, ask me what I'll give you and, and I'll give it to you. Some might ask for a long life. Neither hast thou asked riches for thyself, nor hast asked the life of thine enemies. So, so you, you didn't ask for any of these things, but you asked for thyself understanding to discern judgment. Behold, I have done according to thy words. Lo, I have given thee a wise and an understanding heart, so that there is none like thee before thee, neither after thee shall any arise like unto thee. And I have also given thee that which thou hast not asked, both riches and honor, so that there shall not be among the kings like unto thee all thy days. Turn to Ephesians real quick, if you will. <clears throat> Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 19. Paul's praying for the church at Ephesus that they'll understand the love of God. And he says in verse 19, And to know the love of Christ which passeth knowledge that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. Now unto him that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us, unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. I want you to know every single solitary time that you go to God in faith, every time you go to God seeking His will, praying and asking God for His will, not only does He hear our prayers, but He answers our prayers, and He will give you more than you could ever imagine. He will give you more than you would ever ask for on your own. That's what he does for Solomon. You ask for wisdom, I'll give you riches too. I'll give you long life, and I will give you victory over your enemies. I'm going to give you all of these things that you didn't ask for. And I want you just to understand that. If Solomon, in the Old Covenant, coming to God through the mediation of the Levitical system, could have an answer to his prayer like that, how much more do we, according to Ephesians, as the, the bride of Christ, how much more will God give abundantly beyond all that we could ever ask or and, and anticipate, that even imagine, give us if we come to Him in prayer. And so I just want to encourage you, you can't, you, you, you just can't, you can't outgive the Lord, but you also can't mess up when you go to God humbly asking for the things that you need, trusting Him because He gives more. I remember when I was a kid, there was a hardware store, and uh, they weighed everything. You remember anybody remember those kind of hardware stores? You go in there, and you you don't buy a box of screws, you buy a pound of screws or half pound of screws or whatever. And everything was in bins, and you'd go and you weighed everything out. And the man that that ran the store, you'd go and you'd say, I need you know I need two pounds of number sixteen nails or whatever, and he would always he'd get his weight and he'd make sure it was balanced and he. would He'd weigh them out, and there's two pounds. And I remember as a kid, I always, 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 I never, ever, ever saw him ever let it go that that needle wasn't on the heavy side of whatever you asked for. Always. And on the ticket, two pounds. 
he always, he made sure that you had a few ounces more than what you asked for every single solitary time. And that's what God did for Solomon. That's what he'll do for you as well. And so the this, this speech pleased the Lord. He says, I've done this. Verse 13, I've also given thee that which thou hast not asked. Verse 14, and if thou will walk in my ways to keep my statutes and my commandments as thy father David did walk, then I will lengthen thy days. So, so his, his length of days is tied to his obedience, but he's got this, this promise. And Solomon awoke, and behold, it was a dream. And he came to Jerusalem and stood before the ark of the covenant of the Lord and offered up burnt offerings and offered peace offerings and made a feast to all of his servants. So, so this is the, the, uh, uh, the great answer to Solomon's prayer. This is why. This is why you have Proverbs in your Bible. This is why you have the Song of Solomon. This is why you have Ecclesiastes. Because God blessed Solomon in this way. Verse 16, it says, Then there came two women that were harlots unto the king and stood before him. And the one woman said, O my Lord, I and this woman dwell in one house. And I was delivered of a child with her in the house. It came to pass the third day after that I was delivered that this woman was delivered also. And we were together. There was no stranger with us in the house, save we two in the house. Now this woman's child died in the night because she overlaid it. And she arose at midnight and took my son from beside me while thine handmaid slept, laid it in her bosom, and laid her dead child in my bosom. And when I arose in the morning to give my child suck, behold, it was dead. But when I had considered it in the morning, behold, it was not my son, which I did bear. And the other woman said, Nay, but the living is my son. And the dead is thy son. And this said, No, but the dead is thy son, and the living is my son. And they spake before the king. So here they are before the king, these two women, and they are having a cat fight over the living child. Okay? Why is this here? It's not in Chronicles. Why, why is this story here? This story is here to show us immediately after God promised wisdom to Solomon, and it's going to show us an example of his wisdom. Then said the king, then, uh, then said the king, The one saith, This is my son that liveth, and thy son is the dead. And the other saith, Nay, but thy son is the dead, and my son is the living. And the king said, Bring me a sword. And they brought a sword before the king. The king said, Divide the living child in two. Give half to the one and half to the other. That is exactly what I do with my kids when they argue. I mean, I, that's exactly it. Stop fussing. Cut it in half, right? Now, is Solomon actually going to... Of course not. He's not going to do this. He would never do this. But... He's forcing them. He's going to draw out the true mother because the true mother will be willing to not have the child in her possession in order for the child to live. Any real mom would do that. So that's what he does. Divide the child. Then spake the woman whose the living child was unto the king, for her bowels yearned upon her son. And she said, Oh, my Lord, give her the living child, and in no wise slay it. But the other said, Let it be neither mine nor thine, but divide it. You can see the... It, it, you know, the, the, the nature of these two women just comes out just like that. The one who's lost her child, she's okay for the other one to lose hers as well. The one who the child is alive, she wants him to live, even if he can't be with her. And then the king answered and said, Give her the living child, and in no wise slay it. She is the mother thereof. And all Israel heard of the judgment which the king had judged. They feared the king, for they saw that the wisdom of God was in him to do judgment. And so there it is. There's a practical example of something that happened that, that we see you know, how Solomon implements this wisdom in judgment in his court. So King Solomon was king over all Israel. These were the princes which he had. Azariah, the son of Zadok, the priest, and Elihor, Eh, and Ahiah, the sons of Shisha, scribes. Jehoshaphat, the son of Elud, the recorder. And Beniah, the son of Jehoiada, was over the host. And Zadok and Abiathar were the priests. And Azariah, the son of Nathan, was over the officers. And Zebud, the son of Nathan, was principal officers, officer and the king's friend. And Ahisar was over the household. And Adanaram, the son of Abdo, was over the tribute. That's the guy, he's the IRS, he's the one who's collecting the taxes. And so this is Solomon's cabinet. These are, these are his, his chief uh, advisors uh, that he has around him. And, and each one of the has a different responsibility within the kingdom. And Solomon had 12 officers over all Israel, which he provided victuals for the king and his household. Each man his month and a year made provisions. So these are, these are the, go in, in, you know, in, the, the governors of states, basically, if you'll think of it like that. Solomon is the king. Each one of these is scattered throughout the land of Israel. 
and they, each one of them had a month that they had to, to bring goods and food to Jerusalem for the king, and that's, that's their tribute. That's, that's what they're bringing. That's, these are taxes. And verse 8, and these are their names, the son of Hur in Mount Ephraim, the son of Dekar and Mekaz and Shal, Shal Bim and Beth Shemesh and Elon Beth Hanain, the son of Hesed in Arubath, to him pertaineth Silkoth and all the land of Hefer. You get your map, look up these, these maps. What he's doing is he's, he's dividing it out. It's not neat and tidy by tribes. It's by certain areas. And so, uh, but these are where these men live. The son of Abinadab and all the region of Dor, the up north, uh, which hath Tapheth, the daughter of Solomon, to wife. This is one of Solomon's son-in-laws. <clears throat> but Baina, the son of Ahilud, to whom pertained Tanakh and Megiddo, and all Bethshan, which is by Zartana, beneath Jezreel, it's in the middle of the country, north and west of Jerusalem, from Bethshan to Abel Mehaloah, even unto the place that is beyond Jokneam, the son of Geber of Ramoth Gilead, this is over in Gilead, on the east side of the Jordan, to him pertain the towns of Jair, the son of Manasseh, which are in Gilead, to him also pertain the region of Argob, which is in Bashan, three score great cities with walls and brazen bars, Ahinadab, the son of Ido, had Mahanaim, and Ahmaz was in Naphtali, he also took Basemath, the daughter of Solomon to wife, another one of Solomon's son-in-laws, uh, Baana, the son of Hushai, was in Asher, and in Eloth, you remember Hushai, David's counselor and friend, this is his son, that's one of these men, can you see how the, the, some of these, it's, it's families that are faithful uh, to the king, and kin to the king, and Jehoshaphat, the son of Peor, in Issachar, Shimei, the son of Elah, and Benjamin, Geber, different Shimei, the other Shimei, he got... Um, Geber, the son of Uri, was in the country of Gilead, in the country of Sihon, king of the Amorites, and of Og, king of Bashan. These are all east of the Jordan. He was the only officer which was in the land. Judah and Israel were many, as the sand which is by the sea in multitude, eating and drinking and making merry. Sounds like, sounds like a, a, a nursery rhyme. All the king's horses and all the king's men were eating and drinking and merry again, right? So, so everybody's happy. I mean, I mean that's the, the that's the they all lived happily ever after. Ta-da! They got peace. They got prosperity. Things are good. And it says, uh, verse twenty-one, and Solomon reigned over all the kingdoms from the river. Now that's not the Jordan. That's the Euphrates River, unto the land of the Philistines, and under the border of Egypt. They brought presents and served Solomon all the days of his life. And Solomon's provision for one day was 30 measures of fine flour, three score measures of meal, 10 fat oxen, and 20 oxen out of the pastures, and 100 sheep beside hearts and roebucks and fallow deer and fatted fowl. This is why Solomon weighed 500 pounds. No, no, he's, he's, he's feeding a, a, an army at his palace, right? Because he's got guys like Mephibosheth and, and the other fellas, you know, that we've read about that he says, you know, you'll eat at my table. He's, he, you know, anybody who's visiting in town, he's feeding them. Uh, he's, he's, he's got the, the uh, care of all of these people that, he's, that eat at his table. And this is, this is one day's provision. Verse 24, for he had dominion over all the region on this side the river. That, once again, that's the, the Euphrates River. From Tipsa, way in the north and the east, even to Aza. Aza is another way of talking about Gaza. So all the way down into Philistine country in the south and west. Over all the kings on this side of the river. And he had peace on all sides round about him. So David had wars most of his life on and off. Solomon doesn't have that. Solomon has peace. He has, he has control over all of the vassal kingdoms that fall in this area. He has control over all of his governors. Everybody's wealthy. Everybody's happy. Everything's working good. Bet that don't last long, right? <clears throat> and Judah and Israel dwelt safely. Every man under his vine and under his fig tree, from Dan even to Beersheba, all the days of Solomon. Dan's in the north. Beersheba's in the south, down in the Negev, in the desert. And that is a statement that you're going to see throughout the Bible, from Dan to Beersheba, just talking about the whole land of Israel. And, and so you, you've just got, you've just got a, a, a wonderful, peaceful, prosperous country and 
and you got peace all around. And so Solomon had 40,000 stalls of horses for his chariots and 12,000 horsemen. Now we begin to see what this wealth that Solomon has, this wisdom and this wealth, what he's going to do with that. So here's where Solomon begins to fade away from God. Let's go back to Deuteronomy chapter 17 for just a second. Deuteronomy 17. And let's start reading in verse 14. It says when... Deuteronomy 17, 14, When thou art come unto the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee, and shall possess it, and shalt dwell therein, and shall say, I will set a king over me, like as all the nations that are about me. Isn't that amazing? You know, Moses tells the people, this is what you're going to do. And then it's years later, it's in the time of Saul and Samuel that this actually happens. So Moses is prophesying here, this is what's going to happen. You're going to ask for a king. You're going to want a king because all the nations around about you have a king. And so you're going to reject God being your king and you're going to want your own king. When that happens, thou shalt in any wise set him king over thee, whom the Lord thy God shall choose. First of all, it's got to be the one that God chooses. That's who is going to be the king. One from among thy brethren shall thou set a king over thee. Not a foreigner. Not, not, he's got to be a natural born Israeli. Right, Thou mayest not set a stranger over thee, which is not thy brother. But he shall not multiply horses to himself, nor cause the people to return to Egypt to the end that he should multiply horses. For as much as the Lord hath said unto you, ye shall henceforth return no more that way. What did Solomon do? Solomon had 40,000 stalls of horses for his chariots. If you have two horses per chariot, that's 20,000 chariots. If you have four horses per chariot, that's 10,000 chariots. I got an idea of one of the reasons why Solomon had peace all around him. Because he has a massive standing army. Chariots are tanks, okay? So, was Solomon supposed to do this? No, he wasn't. Pure and simple. No, he was not. Okay? Not only that, but verse 17 of Deuteronomy 17 says, Neither shall he multiply wives to himself, that his heart turn not away, neither shall he greatly multiply to himself silver and gold. And, and it goes on. And so, you, you know where this is headed. And so, so, here we see the fade. Mercy me, I think it was saying about the slow fade. And, and we see it starts out by... <laughs> Well, he loved the Lord, but he still offered sacrifices in the high places. And he didn't marry an Israelite wife, and that could be a problem. And he starts to amass this massive chariot force and all of these thousands and thousands of horses. And anyway, so so we see this fade in Solomon's life. He says uh, at, at verse 27 of 1 Kings 4, And those officers provided victual for King Solomon for all that came unto King Solomon's stable. Every man in his month, they lacked nothing. Barley also and straw for the horses and dromedaries brought they unto the place where the officers were, every man according to his charge. So he's got got massive uh, cavalries of horses, uh, chariots, and dromedaries. Verse 29, And God gave Solomon wisdom and understanding, exceeding much and largeness of heart. I like that. Largeness of heart. Remember the Grinch? You know, his heart was three sizes too small. And then it, you know, it. well, Solomon starts out with largeness of heart. Even as the sand that is on the seashore. So, so this, this incredible, I mean, basically that means limitless. Solomon's wisdom was limitless. Now, when you have that kind of wisdom, that kind of knowledge and that kind of understanding... As long as your heart is aimed toward God, that is a wonderful thing. But if your heart begins to stray from God, well, now you wade off into who knows what, right? And so Solomon's wisdom excelled all the the wisdom of all the children of the East Country and all the wisdom of Egypt. Now that's a statement right there. I mean, Egypt is going to spit out all of these massive monuments and all of that kind of stuff, the the buildings that Egypt did, the architectural things that they did, all the wisdom of the East. 
<clears throat> for he was wiser than all men, than Ethan the Ezraite, and Heman and Calcol and Darda the sons of Mahol. And his fame was in all nations round about. Ethan the Ezraite is a psalmist. He is responsible for Psalm 89. And so he's a contemporary. He's either, he's either a contemporary of David or of Solomon, one or the other. So he's talking about somebody that's in the land, another Israelite. Solomon's wiser than him. And apparently that was a mouthful because everybody recognizes these boys, these sons of Mahol, and how wise they are. He's like, yeah, Solomon's wiser than them. Wiser than all the men of the East and all the nations round about. His fame has gone out. And we're going to see uh, visits by foreign dignitaries to come and find out just how wise Solomon is. Uh, it says in verse 32, And he spake 3,000 proverbs, and his songs were a 1,005. And he spake of trees from the cedar tree that is in Lebanon, even unto the hyssop that springeth out of the wall. He spake also of beasts and of fowl and of creeping things and of fishes. So that means that Solomon was a poet. He was a musician. He was a zoologist. He was an ornithologist. He was an entomologist. And he was an ichthyologist, right? Because he's basically the world authority on all of these things. Uh, he's, he's, not just, he's not just writing inspired scripture, even though he is doing that. He's studying the fish. I mean, who has time to do this? Only a king who's wealthy and has peace has time to do this. Because David didn't have time to do this. He was either fighting wars or gathering up stuff for the temple. But see, Solomon lives at a different time. He has a time of peace, a time of rest. It's a renaissance. That's what it is. It's a renaissance for Israel. And Solomon is at the head. He is the uh, Leonardo da Vinci of his day. Okay, He is the Albert Einstein of his day. But this wisdom isn't this big egg-headedness. It's wisdom that comes from God Himself. So... At this point, I just want to, I want to encourage you. You know, if God gave him all this wisdom, look at what he did with it. Okay, now he's going to mess up. He is going to mess up. But before he messes up, was Solomon a scientist? You better believe it. That's what all of those, that's why I looked up all of those ologist things. He's a scientist. He is a biologist. He is a, a, a student of these things. And, and I just, I want to encourage you, as you launch out into life, listen, uh, yes, you need to know the Word of God. You need to study the Bible. But you also need to study fish and the animals and geology and astronomy and, uh, you know, uh, chemistry and mathematics and all of these kind of things as well. And God gives that kind of wisdom as well. Wisdom to understand the Word of God. Wisdom to understand His creation. Why wouldn't He? He does. He loves that. He loves His creation. He made it. He put all of these things here for us. So, so when we launch out and we, we fulfill the good works that God has for us to do, uh, we need to be reflecting God's image in all of these different areas of life. So just think what Colossians says. Whatever you do, in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Does that mean you can be a scientist for Jesus? You better believe it. Now get ready because you're going to have to run right up against all of the evolutionists and, and, and all of that. But go do it. I have a book at the house that... I have two of them. I have Each one of them is 50 scientists, contemporary scientists, that are not evolutionists that are young earth creationists, believers, followers of Jesus that are real scientists, physicists, chemists, biologists, geologists, all of these different kinds of, of scientists. That's what Solomon was. The wisdom he had came from God and he enabled him to do that. And there came of all people to hear the wisdom of Solomon from all the kings of the earth which had heard of his wisdom. I just want to encourage you tonight. James tells us, if you lack wisdom, ask of God. Ask in faith and, and trust Him to give you wisdom. That's what Solomon did. That's what Solomon gave him. And, and God will give you wisdom too. And He'll give you wisdom for all that other stuff too. So when your chemistry uh, class rolls around. Not when your chemistry test rolls around. 
when your chemistry class rolls around, if you will diligently read the book numerous times, diligently listen to the lectures, diligently perform the experiments, diligently do the homework, God will give you wisdom. And when the test rolls around, you won't have to be praying for Him to bail you out because He'll have already given you the wisdom. You'll be able to take it and do well. Amen? That was a real quiet amen. Heavenly Father, we love you and praise you. We thank you for the Word of God. And I just pray for each and every one tonight, especially your Lord, for, for our young people tonight. And I pray that they, would, that they would come seeking wisdom from you. Lord, the wisdom of this world is foolishness. But the wisdom that comes from you is the truth. Give us an understanding heart. Teach us wisdom and knowledge. Help us, Lord, to be able to be leaders in the world that we live in. But help us to be godly leaders, Lord. Servants who love and who point others to your son, Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you. I love you. Glad you're here.